All right, great, great to be here. It's been good uh, listening to some of the conversations, particularly about gas. If you go in Australia at the moment, uh, we're one of the biggest exporters of gas in the world, yet uh, we've, got a, uh, we've got an electricity crisis, an energy crisis in Australia because we don't have enough for ourselves. So, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm going to talk about things that are spatial more than anything else and how you can increase um, the value to your business by knowing a little bit more about it. Can anyone tell me, is there any networks out there who actually think they know where their assets are? Is anyone going to put their hands up? No? Well, that, that's pretty right. We, we pretty much don't know where the assets are. You'll go talk to some CEOs. Of course, it's down there. It's on the corner. I can see the pole there. They know just about where it is, but they don't know really where it is in space. And that's a, that's a critical issue because uh, our world is changing. We've talked a lot about big data and those sorts of things but we don't have really good data on our assets. So I was just going to start with this slide, which is these moments that really define us. And uh, one of those is uh, Matthew across there. This cyclone here in Australia is one that hit two days ago. Now, I was the CEO of the, uh, the entity that uh, covered most of Queensland. So I've been through quite a few uh, cyclones. And what I found, I remember going down to a response to one of those and going into the control room uh, and it, it was a disaster response room, it wasn't our switching control room and here is everyone up there on the whiteboard just drawing things up on what substations were out and uh, you know we'd be sending people out in the field to try and understand what's happened out there and that's how we gather information. You sit there and tell someone today that the only way you know what's out there is if you send people physically to go see where those wires are down uh, and they'd be surprised. So look, these are the moments that define us and I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. I was quite uh, concerned when I, I was actually in the US when Matthew hit and uh, the, the flooding that occurred afterwards. It happens all the time on these events. The flooding that comes down actually creates, uh, has a bigger impact in many cases than the cyclone itself and it certainly did in the case of Matthew. So information's a critical asset. Uh, does everyone agree with that? Before it was just the poles and wires that we said, you know, we're a utility company, we've got a rate of return on that. But more and more uh, important is, is, is information. It's becoming critical about what we know about our customers, what we know about the energy, what we know about the environment, what we know about the, the physical asset itself, uh, and starting to bring all that together to make good business decisions. Customer relationships are obviously important and also control. So uh, we're trying to get more and more control of the network to be able to move demand around. And people are putting batteries in and people are switching those things. So how do I understand what's being controlled in my network when and how do I stop it from burning down? So a little while ago in Ergon, uh, uh, back in about 2010, uh, a guy came to me and said, look, here's some technology in which we could bring together to understand more about the asset. I was spending $104 million a year cutting trees at that stage. Uh, I could see the reliability improving over the last couple of years, but my contract costs were still going up. It was one of the things I couldn't see in the business. I could see the poles, I could see the wires, I could measure them, I could test them and do all these sorts of things. But in terms of the vegetation, I had no data whatsoever. So we started a project called Roams that won the uh, Edison Electric Institute Award back in 2015, the International Award for Innovation. And it was pretty much creating a 3D virtual world of our, our, our whole asset. And not, not just creating data that people then had to walk through and uh, touch and all that sort of stuff. It actually has all the business rules for the company embedded in it. So it starts to drive your, your asset replacement programs, your vegetation programs, your compliance, because the data is there. Now the data sources are coming from all over the place. You're getting your automated vehicles out there now that are scanning, etc. You're going to be able to put scanners on trucks. You can do whatever you want. In this case, we used, um, we used a plane at 500 metres so that we could fly over towns, etc. So in terms of the, uh, the value that we get from this, we get the virtual world, we get the network model. It's amazing to see uh, how far out some of these models are, the vegetation, the clearance and asset condition. But I'll also add to that disaster resilience. This is a, this is a real exercise somewhere here in the US. Uh, I, 
I understand I'm not allowed to say where it is, so I won't. Um, uh, this tells you about where your poles, your, your, your pole locations. 49,000 poles were a good match, 25,000 weren't. On average, they're about 32 foot out. So some people say, well, what difference does that make, you know, 32 foot out? It would make a lot of difference if it's on the other side of a river. It makes a lot of difference when you start deploying distributed resources across your network. It makes a lot of difference when you're trying to measure uh, the vicinity of an asset to a building. One of the re reasons I did it in the first place was uh, one of our last fatalities was a paint painting a sign on the side of the road. Our conductor was too close to the sign. He was killed when his aluminium post hit the, the actual conductor. It was too close. So where's your asset? The green lines there show where the asset actually was, I think, and the red line is what's in the GIS system. Vegetation, being able to identify where the actual vegetation's hitting. Is it within my business rules? How do I lower my risk? How do I improve reliability? I'm advising a company in, in Australia at the moment who's purchasing Endeavour. One of the key strategies that we're putting in there is creating a 3D virtual world of the whole Endeavour network so that we can bring down vegetation operating costs. Then we're able to scan out on this and take it up to a regional level. I could take it right across, right up to Australia if I wanted to take it right down to Queensland and look at where those compliant conditions are. So if the regulator decided for whatever reason they wanted to be harder on me, I could adjust those, those parameters. If I wanted to differentiate between urban areas and rural areas, I could start to change the business rules. I can start to risk manage down to a location. Now, most companies start to change their poles based on a certain condition. They do so, particular analysis and measurements, and they, they change it consistently around the business. Well, what if I did my engineering, my risk management, down to an individual pole? Okay? There's one, one thing that's true. It's spatially where that pole is in the ground and what's connected to it, the customers, the energy, the wires, those sorts of things. The analytics. This is an example where we're measuring the growth of the trees year on year. You can see where it's moving away, where it's getting closer. So you get to start, start to understand the environment around your assets. Ground clearances. Um, as I said, this was a big issue for me particularly. In our area, we had a lot of contacts with... Uh, you know, cane harvesters, those sorts of things, hitting conductors. In fact, uh, at one stage there, a couple of years ago, we had a lady go out and, and check on a horse out, out in the paddock and she walked straight into a 22,000 volt conductor right across her forehead. Not a good thing. She survived. But here's an example. The, the actual technology is picking up the conductor heights everywhere around the business. When we turned it on in year three, and we deliberately did it in year three, we did vegetation first, we waited for the conductors, we turned it on, we had something like 30,000 spans under clearance. That's with, before that, we had people going out inspecting these things, but they, you, know, you make mistakes. It's not, it's not accurate. When you use computer-generated, machine-based learning, virtual world reality to millimetre accuracy, you start to pick up problems across your network. That is a live... Uh, conductor in, our, in Ergon's patch in Queensland that uh, was picked up by the, the uh, technology. This is an interesting one. Uh, again, in the middle of Queensland, single wire earth return, year before up in the top corner, year after down there, you can see the dead cattle down around the bottom of the line. Unfortunately, we didn't get there quick enough for that one, but uh, we were doing it every year uh, rather than every five for the, 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 the ground-based inspections we do. So in this one, you can see the conductors come off the side of the uh, actual cross arm. It's swinging over there. That's the actual the the uh, utility sent their people out to have a look and validate those sorts of things. And there it is, swinging in the air. So talking about disaster response and resilience, um, it's a it's a fantastic tool to be able to respond to these events in a timely manner. This is the bushfires down in uh, down in Tasmania a number of years ago. We didn't know where the power lines were. I rang up the CEO and I said, look, I'll send down this technology. You can have a look at that. Didn't understand it. I sent it down anyway, just to do proof of concept. And we captured that area of the peninsula. 
What you can see there, that's what Google Earth looks like. When you overlay what we captured, you can see those pink lines there. You can see that we've identified where the power lines are for all the object recognition that's in the machine. Uh, wherever there's a gap, you sca scan into that and you can see the power lines coming in from the left-hand side. Uh, nothing where the easement's gone, just scan down into, into that particular area. You can see the poles down. Now, at that stage, Aurora couldn't even get into the area. They were banned from the area by the disaster response people. So, at this point in time, we're capturing this data and enabling them to respond. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this photo? Yep, you're the only, one of the only ones to ever get that. <laughs> You're one of the only ones to ever get that. So, exactly. So this is a little town in Denali. It was all over the television. The people escaped into the water. The town was on fire. It's basically a block. Uh, but as you can see there, you've got the utility trucks restoring power, building the lines, and there's nothing there. They should have been on the, the two lines that came down from Hobart into this area. So as a, as a response coordinator, you know, you're deploying all this resource, but are you effectively getting use from it? Are you getting the customers on as quick as you can? In this case, Cyclone Mar sorry, Cyclone Marcher came through in 2015. We flew over the network. We identified all the defects within 24 hours. It was back in the office and processed within 24 hours. We had trucks on the road with the logistics of poles across arms being deployed, high voltage generators, all those sorts of things. Cyclone Yassi took us. 28 days to get every client back on. Uh, this one took 10, okay, from start to finish. So it's starting to take costs out. Each day for us is about three to four million dollars. For the first time ever, we were able to um, plan the response. So after we'd flown, our people sat down and they looked at uh, how we're going to restore, how can we get the most customers on quickly. And what you can see there where the social media peaks is where we actually published on the internet the restoration plan. So we told people what day they would be restored. Never been able to do that before. That's the power of information. We had all this massive amount of information in front of us. We could understand what the, uh, the event looked like and therefore we were able to publish. Now in these events, the com company comes out the other side with a better brand than it went in. And then you get into the disaster resilience space. So. Well, I can now respond well to disasters, but let's now talk about how can I avoid some of those impacts? How can I reduce the impact on the community? How do I know where the power is going to go off and where it's going to go on? So we started to do disaster mapping, resilience planning. Where do I put distributed switches? These sorts of things. Uh, this is Townsville, which uh, we modelled a cyc Category 5 cyclone coming in with a five-metre storm surge. We're able to strategically plan the network. How do I microgrid certain areas? How can I get uh, energy from the north? Those sorts of things. How can I get business up and running? Because a community really gets back to its heart once its businesses are up and running and people are going in and starting to work again. I uh, can also spot a fly. Can you see the fly? <laughs> That's at 300 foot. Uh, with a helicopter, that one. That's not with a plane. So, future state, what's the difference between these uh, three entities? People, people say utilities are all, you know, old school, you know, we're all we're moving forward, we're gonna, everyone's going to go off grid, uh, distributed energy resources, all those sorts of things, I love all those sorts of things. The reality is there, that this is all shared economy, okay? Uh, I share my house, I share my car. And in this, this one, I'm going to share my energy resources. So in, in Ergon, uh, the business I used to run, we had 30% of customers, 30% of standalone houses had solar on their rooftops. Out of the 2.4 gig grid, we had 1.7 gig of distributed energy resources in it. Uh, so you start to get back to that platform model. The network's there to share the resources. But how can I deploy those resources in the future and know that it's safe? I'm not sure what you're getting here, but you know we're getting retailers coming in and putting sub batteries in subdivisions and resources in subdivisions. 
it could be AGL over here, Origin over here, and a developer over here, all being fed by the same line. Now, they're, de they're deploying resources for the wholesale market. They're trying to take prices down, but they're doing it on the network. Now, we do that at transmission level now. We've got big base load power stations, we've got peakers, and we understand where the constraints in the transmission network is. Take that down to distribution. Do you know? Do you know what's on your network? Do you know all the resources are there? Do you know who's deploying it? Do you know when you're going to burn down that wire? Do you know when that wire is going to sag into, a, into someone's balcony where they're having lunch and all these sorts of things? Do you have enough intelligence of your network to enable that? That transactive energy future. So, I'd argue you need more in terms of an information-enabled future. We talk a lot about, a lot about energy uh, at these sessions and smart meters and smart grids, etc. cetera, uh, but you also have to have a significantly greater levels of intelligence. So if you can bring in your services, your human resources, your condition base, your built environment, your assets, natural environment, energy, spatial, customer, social, to a common point being the GIS location where it is actually located physically in the earth, then you can significantly improve the operation of your business. You can run a transactive energy business, you can bring your operational costs down, you can increase your customer service as you take your risk off in terms of vegetation outages and those sorts of things. You can do your analytics around your network. What's, the, what's, what's my network look like in 10 years time? What do I have to replace? Where's the distributed energy resources? Where can I switch? How do I bring down my insurance costs? So the fusion of all that information is absolutely critical, creating a virtual world, an augmented world. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>